Okay, start over. So I'm interested in, in how children become able to pursue ideas. And I'm going to start with a story. So the person on the screen is a man um, named um, Robert Cairns. And in the 1960s, he worked in the city of Detroit in the United States, which is the epicenter of car manufacturing. He worked for Ford Motor Company. And he was driving to work one day in his car, and it was raining outside. And um, it wasn't raining hard, but it was raining enough to make it hard to see through the screen. And he was waiting at a red light, and he became very irritated because when he turned off the windshield wipers, he couldn't see at all. But when he turned them on, they went too fast and it was squeaking across the glass. And it was very frustrating to him. So he was getting more and more frustrated. And suddenly his mind went to uh, about seven years before on his wedding night, where he was sitting in the hotel room with his wife and they opened a bottle of champagne and the cork flew up into the ceiling and came bouncing back at his eye. And at the, he would have lost his eye, but at the last minute, he blinked. And as he sat there in the car with the rain pouring down, he thought to himself, why can't the windshield wiper be more like an eye blink? And out of that insight came the discovery of something, I hope you know what this means, intermittent windshield wiper. It goes fast or slow depending on how rainy it is. It made the car industry millions and millions of dollars. It made him very rich as well. It was a huge change in the way we experience driving a car. Um, and a man named John Seabrook wrote a book about it, a wonderful book, and he called it Flashes of Genius. But I want to argue that um, inventions, ideas, good ideas do not come in flashes. They take time, which is really a major theme of what I want to talk about. And they are not only the province of geniuses. Everybody's capable of having ideas, although not everybody makes million of millions of dollars from their ideas. So the question is, how does this happen developmentally? Where does the capacity to pursue an idea come from? And for me, it starts with curiosity, with the urge to find out. Um, and that's what I spent quite a while uh, doing work on. And in the very beginning, from, from within a few weeks of life, children are amazingly adept and attuned to detecting changes in, in patterns, to, to detecting uncertainty or novelty in their environment. And two of the most, the oldest definitions of it come from Jerome Kagan and Jean Piaget, the developmental descript definitions of it. It's the need to resolve uncertainty or explain the unexpected. And that urge and that ability to detect when something's unexpected or uncertain is really the engine that drives early intellectual development. And it's very robust in infancy. Every typically developing child has that capacity and uses it voraciously. That's a whole other talk about how pervasive and powerful it is before children get to school. But uh, I could talk forever about the marked drop we see in, in that urge when children get to school, but I won't go into that right now. Um, so is this showing up the way it should? Not really, but I guess good enough. Okay, so um, early on, children want to know what things are, what sounds they make, where they are, when things are going to happen. It's an incredibly physical form of curiosity. And to a great extent, they explore that kind of curiosity with gestures. They put things in their mouths. They look for a long time. Um, they knock on things. They take things apart. At a certain point, and it's usually in the second year of life, they get this incredible new tool for pursuing their curiosity. They learn to talk. And once they can talk, they can ask questions. Once they can ask questions, they are not confined to curiosity about the immediate environment, uh, the here and now. They can ask about things that have happened long ago or will happen in the future. They can ask about things they can't see. And I have, and that we call that epistemic curiosity, the desire to learn, to find explanations for things, how things work. And that is I think, although it's not only through language that we pursue that kind of epistemic curiosity, I think that's a primary mechanism for exploring it. And in the child's world, it changes everything. It makes the world fundamentally different. And it leads to the following kind of conversation. So this is a mother and a child, a two and a half year old, I think she was. And the 
I'm having trouble seeing this, so I'll read it from here. The, uh, the little girl says, why do dogs poop outside? And the mother says, because that's what animals do. And the child says, why don't we poop outside? And the mother says, because we're people. And the child says, but you said people were animals. And the mother says, yeah, but people have houses. And the child says, but this is Lucky's house too, right? And the mother says, yes, but even so, Lucky's a dog. And the child says, but they don't like to poop in a toilet? And the mother says, I don't know. Lucky's never tried it. And the child says, but he might like it, right? And one of the reasons, and I, I'm interested to hear more about Rania's ideas about this later, I, I use this example is the enormous skill that very young children show at asking questions. When they want to know the answer to something, um, even a complex and mysterious phenomenon, like the difference between dogs and people and their pooping habits, um, they ask and they persist. And research shows that they know the difference between when they've gotten a good answer and when they haven't. And it, it affects their question asking behavior. I'm not gonna have time to go through all of these, but this is an example. Well, wait, this I wanna go to first. So to, am I gonna be able to go back? No. Uh oh. Yes, I think so. Ah, how do I go back? Oh, I'm losing my whole talk. So I'll just say, um, can you go back for me? I'm so sorry. That's great. Okay, great. Uh, going forward. Okay, so they also ask a large number of questions about the cultural world. They're trying to understand why people do the things they do. And, and it's in cultural terms. So the child says, what's this? And the mother says, spinach, which is kind of like the lettuce, kind of like lettuce that you cook. And the child says, why sometimes you call it lettuce and then spinach? And the mother says, that's all the same. It's green like lettuce, but you cook it. And the child says, how did you know when it's lettuce or how do you know when it's lettuce or spinach? Sometimes you like to cook it and sometimes you don't. So the questions have to do with sorting out the world of social conventions. I'm going to skip that one because I'm never going to have time for that. I want to go back. Oh, damn it. This, this is a disaster. Okay, this one I'm very interested in showing you because it relates to later work I've done. This is from the Childless Database. Do you all know the Childless Database? It's a wonderful online resource of collect natural sa samples of natural language occurring in people's homes. Some of them are from schools, but mostly they're in people's homes. And you can comb through it for examples of whatever you want. In this case, we combed through it for examples of things that children were asking about over time. And I'll return to that in a minute. But in this example, a little girl who's four is playing with some toys. She's just learned a little while ago that her pet has died. And the mother says, and he got himself ready to die, Laura. He took his nest down and he knew he was dying and he got himself ready. He knew he was dying? Yes. He knew, the father says. How did he know he was dying? He could feel inside, the mother says. And the father said, a feeling in the air. And the child says, I don't want to die. And the mother says, mm. And the mother says, we're not going to. Later on in the same day, the child is playing and says, I wonder what it feels like to be dead. Um, I think this speaks to something you two were talking about that I'll get to again at the end, which is the idea that children create their own areas of uncertainty based on the thoughts or knowledge they have about something. And I think that's a very important characteristic of curiosity that goes beyond curiosity about things that are presented to them. Okay, let's see if I can do this. Okay, that. Um, in a wonderful study, uh, one, one of the first studies to show that question asking is much more prevalent at home than it is when kids get to school, Tizard and Hughes found that when they looked for what they called episodes of intellectual search, that is conversations that expand a child's knowledge, the most challenging conversations intellectually tended to occur at mealtimes or when the mother and child were doing nothing in particular. I think this is very important for our understanding of educational settings because it turns out that ideas love leisure. Um, and that's a conflict that we face in a school setting, how we promote curiosity in a setting where leisure is anathema. Okay, so because I became very interested in this idea that children might pursue a topic of curiosity over time, my student Whitney Sanford and I um, asked 
parents across the United States to report to us three topics that their four to seven-year-old children had pursued over a number of weeks or months. And we called these intellectual projects. It was a big survey we got. Well, I don't know if it's big, but for us, it was big. 260 parents from all across the United States and from every socioeconomic background and region to answer our survey. And we found that, in fact, almost every parent reported questions the children had asked a number of times over a period of days, weeks, or even months. And there was quite a pattern to it. So this may be too tiny for you to see, but um, by far the most prevalent question that kids asked in, in these data were, was about death in the afterlife. And the next most sort of popular, interesting topic to children was about nature and biology. The third was about extinction and almost always about dinosaurs. So um, kids are, there's a very powerful interest in that. And then you can see it, it goes on from there. Um, and you can see all kinds of wonderful questions. Why can't boys have babies? Why do bees sting? Um, and where do you go when, when you die? That's a, a big one, which I'm gonna talk about more in, in a minute. Um, but in fact, it's not unusual, it's the rule for children to pursue a line of inquiry over time, even when they're quite young, even when they're four and five. Um, however, inquiry isn't the only part, uh, the only component to having ideas. There's this other key component, which is which I call invention. I don't call it creativity. I'm glad to talk about that with you later. Um, and I first thought of this when I was watching children in natural settings at schools and daycares, and I was counting episodes of curiosity and I kept looking for their expressions of curiosity when they were playing. And I saw a lot of it, but I saw this other thing that wasn't curiosity. And I realized it was invention. They were making things. They were creating things. That's my grandson. He yeah. created a house. Um, and if I can get this to play, this is a four-year-old playing with some toys. They're magnetiles. And he's not only inventing little objects with the toys. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do it. Oh, yeah. Um, but he's listened to his language. It may be hard for you to follow because it's it's a four-year-old singing in English. But he's singing about what he's doing with the magnetiles. Can you hear it? Yeah. Not really. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I'm not ice cable anymore. I'm not ice cable anymore. It's transformed something. Okay, so I'll stop it there because I want to go on. He says as part of his song, we could fix any problem. And that's the key component of invention, that kids are solving a problem. And the question is, what kind of problems do they try to solve? So here are some examples just visually of different kinds of problems that children solve, even when they're as young as four and five. They, they write music. And even if they don't write it, this was in a study of children's music writing. They make up songs all the time. Uh, did I do something else bad? No, no, no. Okay. Um, uh, they invent... Um, forts, and that happens to be a school where the middle picture where children were given about an hour a day to build forts, and they built all kinds of forts. And in a in a classroom that devotes itself to invention full time, a group of kids uh, invented a way to keep their zippers up called a zipper tipper. Um, and, and that's the red zipper on the right. And this is a classroom, the classroom where children spent um, the bulk of their time inventing things just to show you what it might look like. They entered competitions and they actually won some of the competitions for their inventions, but they had to decide what they wanted to uh, invent. So I think children are good inventors. They tell stories, they make up games, they build things with magnetiles, um, they make up songs. But the research says something different. The research says that they're not good at, at inventing. Uh, so as, does anybody know the work of Apperly and Cutting about invention? 
So you give children a sort of an empty plastic bottle and there's a little prize at the bottom in a little basket and you give them some materials, including pipe cleaners, and you ask them to get out the little basket because there's a sticker in it they might want. And when you ask four-year-olds to pick a material from the materials and fashion it into something that can get the basket out, they're not good at it. They can't do it. And it's not because they can't bend the hook and it's not because they don't know what they want bend the uh, pipe cleaner, it's be, uh, they, don't, they don't know why. Their argument is that it's because, and then suddenly at about eight, they can do it. And the theory behind that is that it's an ill-defined problem space. Children can't bring all their different kinds of knowledge and skill together in that moment to solve that problem. And that may be true, but the problem is it's not a problem to them. <laughs> uh, and children are much more resource resourceful when they're solving a problem that's a problem to them. So um, we had this idea that maybe it's their lack of knowledge about the material that leads them to be limited in their problem solving task. In fact, there is some cross-cultural research that shows that children who go up, grow up in fishing communities are a little better at this task. Uh, so we did, I'm, how much time do I have? I'm gonna run out of time. Uh, you, you still have around uh, five minutes for talking. Oh and, my God. And then 10 minutes for questions. Oh my God, I might go a little late, okay. I'll, I'll hurry. So we invent we invented a version of this that would address some of the problems we saw in Cutterly, Cutting and Apperly's research, which is we made it more engaging to them. Who wants to hook a little basket with a boring little sticker out of it? We made a creature and we told a story about rescuing the little creature. Um, and then we varied the conditions in order to find ways to provide knowledge to the children, thinking that might help. And so in one um, condition, we modeled it, but in a non-identical way. That is, we showed them some demonstration of how it might be done, but it wasn't exactly what they were supposed to do. In another condition, we called the embodied co condition, we had them make things that they could hook and loop, and we had them act it out. We thought, well, maybe it's the lack of embodiment that's holding them back. In another condition, we gave them lots of pipe cleaners. That was the tool they needed. And we invited them to play with the pipe cleaners and make different things with it. And finally, in the last condition, we told a story about a child who went fishing and fashioned uh, a hook out of something um, and thought that maybe just the background knowledge about that, like the children in the fishing uh, village might help them. In fact, we were wrong. None of those forms of knowledge or experience on their own help the younger children solve the problem. We found just what previous researchers had found. However, when reminded of their early experience in a very brief and simple way, like, but remember the thing we did before? Remember when you played with the pipe cleaners? Uh, most of the ch children did solve the problem. So all they needed, and again, this is very relevant for educational settings, was a cue, a kind of metacognitive cue about drawing on your own knowledge. And, and that helped them tremendously. And actually in that case, it didn't seem to matter which of the conditions they had been in. It was the reminder that made the difference. So as I said, the problem with an ill-defined problem space for children is it's not their problem. And also they need more time. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little about this. I don't, I'm gonna go really quickly through this. Um, this is a task I created with a, that same student from before, Whitney Sanford. We had the idea that children would invent better if they were more interested in the problem, if they could choose materials they liked, and if it had greater narrative heft, was more exciting stories. So we had a river and we had a house on one side and something else on the other side. It was a very exciting story about, and you could choose your toys, a fireman and a and a lost child and a king or queen and a prince or princess, different scenarios. They chose which they liked. And then they looked at the materials they could use to solve the problem of getting over the ri river to rescue the lost dog or child or whatever. We had two conditions and this relates to the metacognitive question. In one condition, while they were getting ready, we just talked about the material. So you like those, so you like red, you know, that kind of thing. In the other condition, we invited them to talk about what they were thinking. So what ideas do you have? So what do you think you might do to get over the river? Um, and then we had them solve the task. It's more complicated than that, but I won't tell you the other details for now. Um, so in the non-priming condition, they tended to produce very simple 
uh, inventions. That's where they weren't given any suggestions about thinking about their ideas. So they typically make a bridge and they take one or two pieces of you know, material and put it across. We measured these on novelty and complexity. That was our, uh, our heuristic for, for looking at invention. Uh, when they were primed, when they were encouraged to think about their ideas before they started solving the task, they would say all these interesting things like, it can fly, and these, the pipe cleaners, they wrap around their tummies, and if they fall, they'll land safely on the water because they are waterproof. So they had much more elaborate thinking and much more elaborate constructions uh, when they were encouraged to think about, um, uh, about their ideas and their thinking process. So this is a lot of good stuff. I'll share it with you later. Um, one of the things that's so interesting about this study is all 87 children in the, in the experiment solved the task. So unlike cutting an apperly, it turns out they all could invent, not equally well, and condition mattered. But it also mattered that they had something they'd like, that it was a rich narrative, that they could choose their materials, and that they had some time. They had as much time as they wanted, actually. Um, I'm going to skip that. So if you're wondering, oh, I got it. I'm almost done. If, a, if you're wondering um, why I think it's so important. So I think I left out the main plot here. Um, I think curiosity comes in first. I think invention comes in during the second year of life. I think very early on when they come together, they are the bedrock of the ability to construct ideas. And if you're wondering why that matters, why I think that's what school is about, just think of some of the inventions and ideas we all know about. This is Alan Turing with the Turing machine. This is Brian Stevenson, who's a very a giant intellectual figure in the United States uh, who developed the Equal Justice Project and the um, Museum of Slavery. And he has this idea that everyone is better than their worst deed. Um, this is... Oh, this is a wonderful study I did of the childhood inventions of the artist Klaus Oldenburg, who made his inventions, invented a whole world uh, over a period of about four years. There are some of his inventions. Um, I didn't even get to the thing I wanted to get to, but I'll just say it, show you very quickly. These are some current attempts we're making to look at children's pursuit of ideas over time. This is a comic strip study where we give kids a chance to fill in a comic strip in which a kid is uh, the protagonist in the comic strip is um, going to find out about ink about um, death what happens after you die about extinction about fairness and about infinity they choose their topic and then they fill in the comic strip with how that child might go about developing their idea about that question um, yeah. This is a study we're doing where we ask children either to replicate a house that they've loved or create, speculate on a house that they would love that they've never seen. And, and we're looking at differences between those two conditions. Also key to the school setting where you're mostly asked to replicate rather than speculate. Um, and, um, and my current interest, and I'll end there, is in the idea that one of the ways to see children develop their ideas in real time is to watch them revise their ideas. So I'll end with a story about my granddaughter. Um, she's When she was four, she was serving me a pretend breakfast with fake food, eggs, and I don't know what, a banana. And suddenly she pulled out a broken uh, food scale that her father had let her have because it wasn't working. And I said, she said, I'm giving you breakfast. And then she said, um, Oh, I need to weigh it. I said, why? Are you worried I'm going to eat too much or too little? And she said, too much. And I said, what would happen if I ate too much? She said, you die or you turn into a frog. Well, you turn into a frog if you were good. You die if you were bad. Well, you turn into a frog for one week. Nope, you turn into a frog for two weeks. And I realized in that moment that watching children revise their ideas is one way to see them see them develop an idea in real time. And so what I wanted to ask you about, but I don't have time, is if you have any ideas about how to get that, because it's so hard to measure. It's certainly hard to measure in a lab setting. I'm going to stop there so I don't get in trouble. <laughs> hi, Goran. He's on the thing. I just had to say hi to an old friend. Questions? 
I have a question. Yes. Uh, you kind of uh, mentioned this at the beginning of the talk. I'm interested in uh, how you conceptualize the difference between invention and creativity and problem solving. Yes. Because I would have called most of the things you mentioned creative problem solving, which touches upon a completely different literature. Right. So I'm interested in your perspective, but I'm trying to understand. Right, understand. Well, for one thing, the reason I don't use the word creative is because, at least in the United States, it, its connotations are not appealing to me. It, it, it sort of belongs, in schools, it belongs in the art room. And it doesn't seem to apply to the science lab, for instance, or to the history course, where, of course, invention is equally important. And I don't see it in my work. I'm not interested in it as a characteristic, you know, you're creative and I'm not creative. I'm interested in it as a behavior. So invention is a behavior that young children invent, that young children engage in all the time, whether they're considered creative or not. Um, and I do think the problem with problem solving in the literature is that it's always solving somebody else's problem. I think invention, at least in early childhood, you're always inventing your own so you have a solution to your own problem. And it makes it very hard to study because just as Jamie has struggled and succeeded, I think, at finding ways to measure curiosity, even though people are curious about different things, I'll never be as curious about a car as I am about a meal. Um, but the same is true of invention. And I think my research sort of contrasting with Cuddy and Apperly suggests that children look much more capable at invention when they're solving their own problems. So it is problem solving, but it's not solving other people's problems. Is that, is that it looks like it doesn't help. I, no, 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 it, it, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't have to help. I'm just, uh, we, we can talk about this okay, uh, later more. I'm really interested okay. because I'm very much into creative problem solving and I'm still trying okay, to okay, well, struggle a little bit that. with the, but we can Wait. talk about this later. Are there questions? Someone have a question? Over there? She asked for some questions. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? So, yeah. so just uh, continuing on that topic, which which I uh, I find really great, uh, brainstorming about the kind of uh, experimental paradigms we, we we could imagine to 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 study yeah. um, uh, how children invent their own problems. Because here, I, I think that's, that's the key idea is that they they happen to be uh, pretty good problem solvers of their own problems. And so, uh, and, and this is something that we call in, uh, in the team autopelic exploration and autopelic learning, where autopelic, where they create their own problems and they solve it. Great. Uh, but something that's really difficult to study scientifically in kids is that we need to find an, a context or an environment where they will be given enough freedom yes. uh, to create a variety of things yes. and select, uh, yes. and still context where we can observe and measure things. Right. And, uh, have you been thinking about? Yeah, that's why I came up with the invent your own world. I have a scoop, two students now who have a task where they say, you walk through a door, what do you see? And the idea is that every, uh, probably most children are going to answer with something. Uh, so no, very few children, I think, are going to say, I don't see anything. I don't know. Or I don't want to go through the door. But even so, you'll see great variation. And we have that in these drawings kids made. Um, we actually wanted to do it with a computer game. I was telling someone yesterday we had we were going to have them do Minecraft, okay. but then the population did, that we worked with had no experience with Minecraft. That would be a great way to measure complexity and novelty. And we introduced a problem in the scenario. You you walk into this, make your house in Minecraft, and then we said, uh oh, a beast has entered. What are you going to do? I think it's really important to make tasks that engage children. My old work is in narrative development. I think, given, and all the developmental research suggests that's true. In, uh, you know, Margaret Donaldson, providing children with an intellectual context or physical context that's gripping to them makes a world of difference. It changes the data. So that's one way. The comic strip study, I have a new idea of how to do that, which is not to, I think it's too hard for them to imagine what the protagonist in the comic is thinking. It's just too much cognitive load there. Um, but I think you could invite children to pick up one of four topics that we know from our survey data are very interesting to young children, like five-year-olds. 
and then give them some information, ask them what they think about it, like what is infinity, then give them a bunch of different kinds of information and then say, now what do you think is infinity? You, you wouldn't see them build the idea, but you would see if there's a change as a on the basis of new information. So that's another idea, but I'm actually desperate for good new research ideas. I really think that this, the time matters a lot and that children need, that most of life, you're not, the kinds of curiosity that are most important to you are not things that jump at you from the environment. And even if something like Bordeaux jumps at you in the environment as you land here, you instantly put it into a broader intellectual context. And you think about it even when you're not in Bordeaux or even when you're in your hotel room not looking around. And I think children do that more than we think. So the one question, one possibility is that we need to give them more time at the tasks we give them um, or see them over time, but in a short period of time, like every day for two weeks. Um, and I think is so boring and sort of cliche, but a lot of the time, at least with five-year-olds, which I know is not necessarily everybody else's subject pool, um, they need to be physically engaged. I have a student now who's a musician who's going to bring children into a room with a lot of different instruments um, and, and see what they do with the instruments. And the idea is to see who learns to play a song at the end. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that's great. It's amazing. Um, I think that there are other questions, but let's keep them for the short okay. break. Great. Uh, thanks again. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs>